Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And for my next trick, my assistant shall saw me in half. Rest assured, no one will be harmed or actually split in two. It's an illusion accomplished by contortions. Contortions, much like those that security often puts dev and ops through, when in reality, the two halves remain a single approach to AppSec the entire time. Which means, this week we talk with Leif Dreisler about shifting security right, or, in other words, building an appreciation from security for the DevOps way of building applications for the user experience. In the news segment, PHP makes two commits disappear, close-up authentication and OAuth sleight-of-hand tricks, zines for wizards, and more. Pick a card, any card, and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. We're proud to announce CISO Stories, a new podcast series in partnership with Cybersecurity Collaborative and Cyber Reason. CISO Stories features the candid perspectives and experiences of frontline senior security executives and dives deep into timely security topics. CISO Stories is hosted by Todd Fitzgerald, VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Sam Curry, Chief Product and Security Officer at Cyber Reason. Listen weekly as they speak with extraordinary CISOs by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CSP. Cloud Native Development presents new challenges for security teams. Ephemeral workloads are scattered across services, and it's hard to identify resources, monitor configurations, and ensure compliance. Prisma Cloud by Palo Alto Networks is a comprehensive cloud native security platform, delivering full stack protection for multi and hybrid cloud environments. It provides deep visibility, threat detection, and data security, as well as protection for hosts, containers, and serverless while enforcing policy guardrails. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Prisma Cloud to gain control over your cloud security. This is episode 146, recorded April 5th, 2021. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Hey, Mike. You know, I'm in the mood to talk about some application security. I don't know about you. That is great, because guess what, John? You're a co-host on Application Security Weekly. And in fact, if you even wanted to hear more Application Security Weekly topics, you could listen to our next live webcast on April 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern, where you will learn how to prepare for modern ransomware attacks. Visit securityweekly.com slash webcast to register now. If you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they're available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com slash on demand. And of course, Mr. Kinsella is always here for your viewing pleasure. Leaf uh, manages the product security team at Segment. The ProdSec team is focused on partnering with software engineering teams to design and implement security features for the Segment product. Leaf got his, security, his start in security industry at Redspin, doing security consulting work, and was later an empl early employee at BugCrowd. He helps organize the Bay Area OWASP chapter, the AppSec California Conference, and LocoMocoSec. Hello, Leaf, and thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great you're here because it was only about a month ago, it was episode 142, we were talking about, much like everyone else I think was talking about at the time, uh, an article you wrote, Shifting Engineering to the Right, um, which I think had some great points to it that we'll, we'll, we'll explore and unlock a bit throughout the next couple, uh, next half hour or so. Um, but first, I'd love to hear just what started you on this path? What was the seed that, that planted this idea to talk about the security shifting to the right into development, which is runs a bit counter from the often a little bit cliche we hear now about shifting security left. Sure. So uh, it actually all started as a submission to LastCon, which is the Lone Star Application Security Conference, uh, which is a great regional OWASP, OWASP conference in Austin, Texas, that's in the Q4 of every year. And as uh, most of the listeners would be aware, uh, pretty much every in-person event got canceled last year, uh, as did LastCon. And so I already had this abstract and this outline built out. And uh, you know, I was thinking like, how else can I show this? And so I decided to, to write a blog. And so that's kind of how this whole, the whole blog got started. But um, really the work started, 
a couple of years prior when um, I was getting started working on security features at Segment and really uh, expanding my knowledge as an engineer. And so uh, after the success that we've seen, um, I just wanted to capture that and try to provide other people with uh, some information and, and some uh, ideas about how if they wanted to emulate some of the, the things that we've been able to accomplish, uh, they could do it at, at their whatever companies they work at. Yeah, that's great. And I think this is one of those articles that that seems like, uh, you know, obvious when you read it, and yet clearly, or maybe not so clearly, uh, not everyone is following these principles. And when I say that, there's, the, you know, one of the great sentences, lines from it is, building customer-facing security features in partnership with dev teams helps you better serve your customers. And now, obviously, developers or perhaps, you know, companies are building products for the external customers, perhaps people like you and I. Um, security teams, their customers might be developers themselves, as well as they could actually be working on, cons the, you know, features for consumers. So I'm kind of curious, just from that angle, you know, what did as you were learning this, as you were working with developers, how did that appreciation build for those, you know, building customer facing security features as opposed to we're just automating something that is for compliance or we're automating a manual process or we're just automating this for the sake of automating this because i think there's a nuance there a difference between pure automation and customer facing features yeah so i i love working on customer facing features because i feel like it uh brings together a lot of the different things that i've worked on uh over the course of my career. And uh, as you mentioned during the intro, uh, my previous role at BugCrowd, I was actually a sales engineer. And so I had got to talk to a lot of different security people uh, over the course of my, my couple years at BugCrowd. Um, and then at Segment, I moved into more of a AppSec, ProdSec uh, role. Uh, but I feel like building features for customers kind of captures some of that uh, some of the parts of, of working as a sales engineer that I liked where you're actually building something that uh, your customers are directly using. Whereas a lot of the work that a security team does, uh, it's invisible to customers. And, uh, you know, maybe that's good because it means that like things are, are going well and uh, it's, it's not something that, that people necessarily see or, or should be seeing. Um, but I think that ProdSec is really where a lot of customers end up judging your security program. Sure, some of them might look at your SOC 2 report or you know, be part of the, event, the vendor evaluation process, but most of your end users won't do any of those things. They're never going to hear about all the awesome things your CERT team's working on. They're never going to mm -hmm. hear about uh, how new employees get onboarded in a secure fashion and then deprovisioned at the end of their time. They're just going to see what they see in the, in the product. And so... I think that that is where a lot of the difference comes from is you're able to draw on inspiration from what you've seen and what you've liked in other products. Uh, I think a lot of security people probably inherently think about, you know, was this two factor authentication signup flow easy? Uh, what it, you know, what methods did we, did they support? You know, you can apply that to really like any product security feature. Um, and then you also get to pull in customer requests, uh, you know, maybe you can look at security questionnaires that you've had to fill out on behalf of uh, prospects that have asked, like, hey, do you support uh, SSO? You know, do you support forced SSO? And then you should be able to kind of figure out uh, if things are, are in use currently, uh, how many customers are using SSO? How, how many dollars does that represent in terms of revenue per year? And then you can use things like that to try to support uh, your argument to build new things. Like if you want to build SCIM, um, SCIM is something that sits on top of SSO and allows your identity provider to uh, provision and deprovision uh, accounts and uh, add people to groups or remove them to groups. And it's a lot easier to make the case for, you know, hey, we should build this when you can say, okay, we are already have this many customers using our SSO implementation. Um, we can upgrade them to this uh, more enhanced version of what they're already using. 
Yeah, and I think what you're hitting there is a lot of the, just the, the benefits of understanding the user experience. You know, one of the other words that we hear often in, in DevOps is empathy, and I think there's some empathy here for just what do users need as opposed to, you know, what they want, or how do you make that process, you know, SSO that you were describing, you know, easier for users to onboard to, because rather than just say, use this because I said so. But so, so there's some benefits there, but I'm also kind of curious, how do you approach just pitching this to a security team, getting them to think, oh, we actually need to shift our engineering right for security wise, because we often hear about security champions. How do we get developers to care about security, security champions, this security champions, this, that, um, but I don't know that we've really heard about, you know, developer champions. How do we get security to understand development? How do we get security to appreciate development? So what does that pitch look like? when you go to security teams saying, let's write some code, let's go work on some, you know, customer code. I think we were very fortunate segment to have uh, some early investment in security um, just from the business, like the business knew very early on, um, you know, we're targeting enterprise customers. Uh, we have to have security lockdown. Like this is something that businesses care about. Uh, it can't be an afterthought. Like it, this has to just be a foundation of our product. So we we definitely had a very uh, fortunate and friendly, uh, you know, origin story at Segment in terms of a security team. Um, but then taking it a step further, I think that a lot of the people that were early hires onto the security team just knew that um, being closer to engineering was the way forward. And that the more we knew about what in engineers were doing, the better recommendations we could make. Uh, it's a lot easier to be to participate in a threat model and come up with realistic recommendations if you've actually worked in the adjacent systems or maybe even in the system that that is being modified or something. And so I think that's where a lot of the buy-in came from was let's actually have uh, you know the people that are on the security team. Let's let's make it so they actually have a very deep understanding of how things are built at Segment, so that when it comes time to provide recommendations or provide training or uh, choose tooling, uh, we're picking things that we as software engineers would want to use, even though we're on the security team. Um, because once you go through whatever the requirements are, you're going to notice really quickly which things are annoying uh, and which things are <laughs> indeed, you know, well, well in instrumented and, you know, easy to use and, and all of those things that, uh, you know, security teams should be striving for because the easier you make things for people, the more likely they are to do them. And, um, you're just going to have a lot, uh, easier time making things easy for software engineers. If you've, uh, walked a mile in their code. No, absolutely. Yeah. Make, make things easy and and uh, easy and secure because both can be possible. So I think so some of the things you're describing, th too, in your article is that um, once you're getting into this development process, you two things you honed in on were, um, you know, fixing bugs, building tests around those, as well as well-written PRs, you know, getting into documentation. So, um, you know, now be honest with this next question. It's just you, me, John, and just a few thousand <laughs> listeners or so. Um, <laughs> How, how much testing and documentation did you, uh, you and the team end up doing? You know, how successful was that, and how was that an easy path, or were there pain points along the way for for those types of engineering tasks as well? Yeah, so I think that uh, you know, initially when I was starting out fixing stuff, uh, I didn't have a lot of engineering experience. Like I'd done a computer science degree, and I had written some tooling and automation and stuff like that as as part of like previous jobs. But I'd never really written code that, uh, you know, if it if it broke, it would really matter uh, the way that it does when you're making production changes to an app that customers are paying you money for. Uh, if you're a consultant and your tooling, you know, breaks, uh, you know, you can kind of just fix it on your own timeline and prioritize it how you see fit. Uh, that's obviously not the case when you're working on like authentication features and stuff like that. And so I think that you know. Uh, I haven't looked at some of my early PRs at, at Segment, but I would say that the documentation probably was like decent, but not amazing. And the, the tests were probably uh, whatever I needed to get by. But uh, over time, you kind of just learn things that regular software engineers know inherently is 
uh, it's a lot easier to get your PR approved if you actually have good tests and if you take the time uh, to write up a nice PR, maybe there's like a before screenshot and an after screenshot. Maybe you're writing up some instructions about how to, you know, test these things manually in addition to the automated test, just so that somebody else that's more familiar can go and take a look at things in the app and see, okay, you know, this, this looks good. Like this is exactly where it is. And it kind of just goes back to like making things easy. Like you want to make it easy for people to review your work so that they're not spending time, you know, fighting through the code, trying to figure out what's going on. And then, you know, maybe they comment like, Hey, you need to rewrite this. Or maybe it's the opposite end where they're just like, uh, like, I don't really know what this is doing and I don't have time to figure this out. And so, uh, either way it's approved. I, I think both of those are bad. And so, uh, <laughs> having good documentation and good tests in your PR is really helpful. It's also really nice. Uh, this is probably something that you won't realize for six months and for about six months until you, after you start writing software, but it's really nice. If you can go to a get blame, look at the PR mm. and then the PR actually has a bunch of documentation. You're like, Oh, that's what this Preach. person was trying to do. <laughs> like maybe there weren't yeah. comments in the code, you know, maybe there weren't as many tests as there should have been like, Obviously, the, that would be ideal, but sometimes you just go and look at the actual PR where this was added and you're like, okay, this actually makes a ton of sense now. You're, you're walking into a question I was just about to ask. Um, and that I think, so for, for someone to come into a code base who they're not like a, a I'll say seasoned, but say a professional software developer, um, that requires the code base to be in a place that they can come up to speed relatively quickly in that whatever that that embed is um i don't think you mentioned the length of time of the article but call it a month or it adds a lot say two weeks so um any thoughts around that is i i, I know you're mainly focused right now on, on you know your current code basis segment but have you have you had war stories from being dropped in somewhere seeing someone dropped in somewhere and they're like what do i do with this or <laughs> has it it's not all roses so or daisies that it's how do people deal with that or how do you prepare to bring someone in to allow them to do that i mean how do you empower someone like that i think a lot of that just goes back to having the, the right relationships in place beforehand um that's how i got comfortable with the segment code base which um, you know, at the time seemed fine to me at the time. Now it, it still seems fine to me. So I, I don't know that it really falls into the, the war story category, but, um, there were tons of engineers that I've asked for help along the way. And that's really how I was able to get to, you know, where I'm at now. Uh, as I mentioned, like, you know, before segment, I had never really made any, uh, production code changes that, that really had any significance. And, um, I've come a long way since then. And it's really just been because of software engineers that are much more experienced than me helping me out with stuff. Um, and that could be something, you know, small and tactical, like just reviewing a PR and telling me what parts are, are bad or what parts are good uh, to actually like helping design a system and giving feedback on a design doc or something like that. And so uh, I think that really you should just see yourself when you join another team, even if it's temporarily, try to follow as much of what uh, a new employee uh, would if they were joining that team, you know, just kind of ignore that you may have some idea about what's going on in the business or like what's going on in this code base. Um, and just, you know, pretend like you're a software engineer that got hired recently and uh, go through whatever that team's onboarding is because presumably they've figured out how to get people uh, up to speed in the code base previously. And, uh, you know, that should should be able to apply to you as well. Um, and so some of the stuff uh, that that I would recommend is schedule one on one with the manager. Uh, I found it pretty helpful to get some of that software engineering mentorship from somebody that, uh, you know, is hopefully making a career out of mentoring software engineers if they're an engineering manager. And then that's a great time to ask them about, you know, documentation, JIRA boards, are there any Slack channels that I should be in? Uh, you know, is there any recurring meetings like stand up? Um, there's a lot of stuff that you kind of just learn through osmosis. Like, I don't know that there's a, a set playbook that's going to apply to every team, but I think just trying to uh, adapt to however that team works is a big part of that empathy piece that, that you were talking about earlier, Mike, um, is just 
try to uh, join their team as a software engineer, not necessarily a security person. Yeah. And, and that's one of the points you make in the article, too. It's like you say, you know, don't just jump in to work on security tasks, work on engineering tasks. And these will give you a chance to learn, as you say, logging, metrics, testing, reliability, and just these aspects of just what does good software look like? And you mentioned, too, just having a get blame that hopefully just can answer why is it, you know, why is it this way? Why is this particular function implemented in this manner? And I imagine that's got to help also be helpful to lead into later on threat modeling so that you could come back to a feature and, and ask questions like, do they consider X and Y? Or, now we have something that has changed in our SSO model or or there there's a new threat vector. Have we considered that or does that affect us? So I'm kind of curious too, even if you've gone into this without focusing on security, was there something that that along the way that surprised you that you understood better about security? Or was there something that you were able to actually take back from the developers from this type of embedded process that fed more into the security minded thinking as opposed to just writing code from a security perspective. Yeah, definitely one of the big takeaways is I feel like it makes our team a lot more confident when we want to make modifications to an existing system. Um, and so maybe there's something that that we want to build uh, as like something to monitor or enhance from a security perspective, something that that's already built. Uh, now, instead of having to, you know, partner with the team from the very beginning and be like, hey, can you show us how this works? What do we need to change? Like, this is what we're trying to do. We can come to them with like a much more baked proposal. And so we can say, okay, hey, we've, we've looked through the code base. Uh, here are some of the like the pseudo code changes that we would want to make. Here's the overall goals of what we're trying to accomplish. Like, this is kind of what we're thinking. Like, can you review this proposal and give much more uh, tangible feedback rather than just helping us kind of build the proposal? And then I would also say that it's good to go through the design review and the threat modeling process and any of the security testing and whatever else your, your company says that you have to do. Go through that from the software engineering side. And so, you know, just because you're the security person that's on a software engineering team, you should not be the person who's leading the threat model or the design review or you know, whatever the other tasks are that are required by your security team to build software at your organization. So make somebody else from your team do that. And then you can be in the room, you can be a participant, but you should be trying to be a participant from the security side. And then you can use anything that felt inefficient or you know, slow, or you know, maybe this just is something that uh, you didn't realize how annoying it was from the security side. Uh, to go through this, uh, it'll give you ideas about like things that that you could automate or or make better in the future. Yeah, that's always the the, the cliche terms. You know, we, we eat our own dog food, or the um, another take I, that I've always enjoyed is we drink our own champagne. Um, but yeah, it's just yeah. understanding going through what security mandated engineers have to go through, and then you know experiencing that yourself can be an eye can can be eye opening. Um, one one of the things, you know, one of the nice things about the article, too, you have a great section near the end, just tactical tips and takeaways. And you've kind of described them a lot as, as we've been talking. One of the things I'm curious about, too, though, is that um, I, I love this, this entire approach, it, but it's a very people-centric approach, which is not a bad thing. But what I'm getting at is it can also often be hard to scale this type of approach in the sense of whether we're trying to build more security or just build more developer knowledge on a security team. So what are some ways, you know, or are there ways that you're looking to scale this out to a broader degree, whether it is building more developer knowledge on a security team or the inverse, building more security knowledge on a developer team? Kind of what does that look like at, on, on a bigger picture for you? Or if you were to try to, uh, you know, double, triple, or, you know, 10 times the size of your current organization that you would want to grow into? Yeah, I think those two things actually feed off of each other because the more things you're able to train the developers to do, the more time the security team has to do other things. And so a great example of this, there's uh, an, another blog from the segment team um, that came out recently, uh, last late last week by my coworker, Jeevan, that's about developer-led threat modeling. 
And so in this, he talks about his experience uh, training developers to do their own threat models. And he also open sources the, uh, the PDFs uh, that he uses for um, the training themselves. And so I think this is a great example of something where it's like, okay, you know, our security team knows how to, how to lead threat models. Uh, we've done it enough times to kind of figure out like what works and what doesn't, um, or at least have some idea of what we think works and what doesn't. Now let's actually try to democratize this so that we have engineers that are leading threat models. And so I think as a, you know, a security engineering team, you should always be looking for ways to automate. And if you can't automate things, uh, you should try to look at and to see if you can democratize them. And something like a threat model, like I don't really know how feasible it is to, to have that be fully automated. I'm sure there's some tooling or something that could help, you know, maybe save some of the burden. But I do think that is a very like people and like meeting and document centric uh, exercise that benefits a lot from the discussion. And I don't know that that's really something that you can capture with today's technology, but that's something where, you know, maybe we do a few threat models a month and now we're trying to pivot to a model where we're just doing a sampling and we're reviewing the artifacts. And so that can free your team up to do something else, whether that's automating the next thing or building the next training. And in the instance of building security features, I think we we had pretty good buy-in because uh, we are a B2B business and the business liked that we were building things that our customers liked. And so it was relatively mm-hmm. easy to convince them to keep funding these ideas of, you know, hey, let's build 2FA, let's build this password strength meter, like let's build SCIM. Like these are things that uh, tangibly improve our security for customers. And so uh, luckily we're in, we're, we are in a, a business where those things are valued. And so we, we've never had uh, too much trouble getting um, the ability to, to work on these types of things. It's always good to hear when when the the path can be easy. And a lot of what you described is it's been an easy approach to build those relationships with engineers, with developers. And just now you're talking about um, how much easier it is to get buy in a lot of the security features. But with 2020, which was a trash fire year, but 2020 is the sense of hindsight can be better. Um, looking back, what was something that actually was hard that you probably would have done a bit differently when you were you know designing this approach to shift engineering right or the way that you approached them or, you know, just what, what might have been a change that you would make that somebody can learn from now and have a little bit of easier time to go about this? I would say try to go all in on an embed earlier. So hmm. one of our first projects that we worked on where is kind of a security engineering uh, pitched this idea of like, hey, you know, we, we want to build two-factor authentication for our customers. Like this is just an expectation. Um, we actually had SSO at the time. And so our, our biggest customers were like, yeah, SSO is fine. But then some of our like smaller or medium customers were like, Hey, we don't have SSO. Like we want to use 2FA. And it was like, okay, that's totally valid. Let's build this. Um, and ultimately the project w- was successful. Like we <laughs> shipped MFA. It actually has really good adoption. Um, but I think we probably could have had a better exchange of ideas because what ended up happening was, you know, we kind of put forth the proposal and then I did most of the work on the like backend within our authentication service. And then somebody else worked on the app gateway and the uh, like front end code. And uh, it was more of just a relay race rather than an embed. And I think I probably missed out on a lot of uh, lessons that I could have learned earlier, whether it was just, you know, things that I picked up during stand up or, you know, things I could have learned from the engineering manager uh, through one on ones or just, you know, being more active, like in their Slack channels. And uh, so I would say that if you have an opportunity to kind of collaboratively build this, you know, whatever this thing is for for your company, uh, really try to make the most of the experience and just, I would say, you know, just go head first into, you know, as much of an embed model as you can. And sure, there's probably going to be some mistakes and learnings and whatnot. But I think that goes back to the importance of spending time in advance, uh, building good relationships with engineering teams, because they're just, they're going to be way more, uh, okay with things not going perfectly if they're like, oh, we we already like the security team. Like we tried something new, we got it 80% right. And, 
you know, we'll, we'll get it 85% right next time or, or whatever. Uh, that that sounds 85% right. That's going to be my motto for the next month. I think I like that. <laughs> Um, so, you know, sort of looking at the article, I think it covers a lot of, you know, this. these were the benefits. This is what you learned, what you discovered. Um, maybe I already asked this, but let me sort of ask in a different way. When you went into this, was there something that, what really surprised you about this experience? Or what did you, you know, what, what did you least expect that was like, oh, and a light bulb went off or, or something just really helped with this experience that, that um, maybe you didn't capture in the article? Sure. I think this is probably somewhere in the article, but like, I remember one of the big early surprises was just how long it takes to do anything. Um, and segment actually has very good engineering tooling. Uh, our deployment yes. pipeline is very solid. You know, if you know what you're doing, uh, and you have your PR approved and whatnot, like you just hit merge, uh, into the, the main branch. And within a handful of minutes for most of our repos, like that change is deployed to customers. And I think, you know, when I first started, like one of the things I took over was management of the bug bounty program. Um, you know, I had seen hundreds of bug bounty programs at bug crowd. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a very easy thing for me to kind of jump in and provide value, uh, immediately. And I remember triaging bugs and writing up the JIRA tickets and, you know, there were, as you would expect, like, uh, a lot of P3s and P4s, uh, some that were higher, uh, of course. And, I just remember looking at the P3s and being like, these things seem so easy to fix. Like, wh why isn't anybody fixing these things? And it was actually kind of good that people didn't fix them at the time because those were some of the early things that I fixed, which got me my got my foot into the door into you know how to build things in Segment and uh, kind of started this whole thing actually. But I remember before I had fixed them, I was like, this seems so easy. Like, this has got to be such a quick fix. And then you learn that nothing is a quick fix. Uh, you know, you have to figure out where the change is. You have to test it, you know, probably some manual testing, maybe write up some automated tests. Uh, you know, you got to figure out something else that, that seems unrelated. You got to take the time to understand, you know, is this function used anywhere else in the app? Okay. It is like, let's actually go figure out, you know, if this change is going to negatively impact this other part of the app that I didn't realize was reusing this component. Um, and then you're like, wow, that actually wasn't a quick fix. That took me like, you know, maybe half a day by the time that, uh, you know, I, I did this and I, I did that and I talked to the right people and I got the PR approved and I, I merged it. And uh, I, I feel like even now, like almost anything I do, I feel like it'll take me at least like an hour or two. Um, and that's after I've been doing this for a few years. And so I, I totally have like, nothing is a quick fix. Uh, everything takes longer than you expect. And so I totally get why uh, lower priority bugs don't get fixed on, uh, you know, whatever the security engineers, uh, whatever they think the timeline should be. So I guess yes. uh, a question from me on this, Leaf, is are you guys working on a blog post for when you take a developer and embed them into the security team? So we actually haven't embedded somebody uh, within our team, I think there is a, a really good opportunity to have them help out with stuff just because developers, uh, you know, solve tough problems all the, all the time. I think a lot of people in the security industry and like, maybe I think this is also changing, uh, think of security as some like esoteric body of knowledge. And like, you know, we, we know all this stuff that like other people don't know. And, uh, I'm sure that makes us valuable and we get, we get paid well as a result of that. But like, realistically, like, I think most software developers could figure out most of what we're doing over here on the security side. Like they figure out, uh, new things all the time. They solve really hard problems. Like, I don't think that a lot of the stuff that we do is, uh, any easier or, or more difficult than what a lot of the people at, you know, my, my peers on the software engineering, uh, team are working on. Um, and I think that they could really help uh, with like, especially just getting something fresh set up uh, in like with a good foundation. Like let's say that you needed to build an internal app to do X, Y, and Z. I think that'd be a great opportunity if you could somehow steal time from a, you know, more seasoned developer just to get things off to the right foot or off on the right foot and get some of the like paradigm set up. Like, I think that's a great opportunity. 
um, to have a developer embed. I think another great area is actually having them build that paved road that you hear security people talk about, where it's like, you know, try to eradicate um, a whole class of vulnerabilities. And a great example of this was um, we maintain a, an open source de design component library called Evergreen. Um, which is the React uh, <laughs> There's an unfortunate library <laughs> that like powers our whole app. And we had an, a developer uh, figure out a way to prevent um, unsafe H hrefs, which is like one of the only ways in React to, to get uh, cross-site scripting is like JavaScript links is like one of the textbook examples of things you need to, to watch out for. And so by default, all of the links used in Evergreen have a, an allow list of schemes. So it's like mail to uh, HTTP, HTTPS, a uh, couple other tell, I think is one of them, a couple other ones, but JavaScript is not one of them. And so you really have to, you know, if, if you wanted to, to use a JavaScript href, which I don't know why you would ever want to do that. Like you really have to go in and, and be like, hey, I want to opt into this. And it also sets the refer headers uh, appropriately. Um, and so I think that that's a great example of something where it's like, we probably could have come up with a way to do that on the security team, but why not have the person who maintains our design component library, uh, do that work because it's going to be a lot more elegant and, uh, it's going to be a better experience for any of our open source, um, or users of the open source library. And so I think that's another great opportunity of something where it's like, Hey, let's, let's bring an engineer into the security uh, fold and have them solve this problem for us. <laughs> that's that's interesting how you respond to that. Um, I mean, I think it's a good answer. Don't get me wrong. Um, but at least when I asked it, what what was in my head was having a developer sit in front of a, a SIM terminal or, um, you know, run the web scans or maybe run the bug priority program and actually see sort of what's coming in before it gets to them. Um, so it's, it's just, it, it, it sounds like you're going to have to have not just one developer, but several come over and help out. Yeah, I mean, we'll always, uh, you know, if a developer wants to work on something on the security team, we're more than happy to have their software engineering expertise help, uh, you know, improve the things that, that we're working on. No, I'm, I'm glad you've been, and hopefully you'll keep improving all of the blog posts that come out of the segments. I missed the one on threat modeling. We'll have to read that and highlight it because threat modeling is another one of our, our favorite topics. Um, as we kind of wrap up here, speaking of things that always take longer than we imagine, um, Leif, what, what's coming up, you know, what, what's what's on the horizon for you? Uh, you know, hopefully we will actually have a, a chance to have in-person conferences in a safe manner. Um, so will you be uh, dusting off and, and sprucing up a shift engineering right um are, are there other uh, other areas that you're also passionate about or interested in that you'd like to you know start to seed start to um uh, share with the broader appset community yeah i think that this would probably be the one that i would submit to things this year depending on what ends up happening um i saw that last con is planning to have an in-person event so uh i know that this is how the, the whole thing got started this time was, uh, you know, last con getting canceled, turning the abstract and outline into a blog. Um, but maybe it'll kind of flip, flip over on itself and, uh, I'll be able to submit to last con this year. Uh, I also, am just keeping my fingers crossed that AppSec day in Melbourne, Australia happens again. I heard that that was an amazing conference in, uh, I think 2019. Um, and, uh, I would definitely su submit to that as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think this would probably be the main thing that I would submit um, just because it's kind of top of mind. And I feel like a lot of conferences, you have to submit, you know, four or five months in advance anyway. And so I feel like this is probably the most most realistic topic for me. No, that sounds great. Plus, an excellent strategy to um, figure out how to take trips to Australia or overseas. Yeah. Um, submit to conferences. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you very I've much. Never been. This is I've great. heard it's mm -hmm. great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so if you go to Melbourne, definitely um, nearby, there's a great beach with penguins. And that's the best I can say right now because unfortunately, we are running out of time. But this was about you and shifting engineering right. So we want to say thank you for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me. And if this stuff seems interesting to the listeners, the uh, segment security team is is always hiring for people that uh, can make a, a difference in our security posture. So check out our careers page.
Sounds great. And it sounds like you'll be able to join a team that uh, doesn't have to do bug bounty triage all the time, because I know that's something, an easy way they can burn people out. So it sounds like a fun experience, a uh, fun team to, to work with. So thanks again. Also want to th- th- say thank you to John, and uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, we're going to take a quick break now and return with news of the week. 